Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. There's so many of you. This is so exciting to see people coming back as COVID numbers go down and people are feeling more comfortable and we're really happy to see you. I do want to welcome any guests or first-time visitors joining us today, and I also want to just greet our virtual congregation, our folks who've been watching us from home on YouTube very faithfully the last few months. We know there's a good group of them doing that every week as well. <clears throat> I do have quite a few announcements today, so bear with me. Um, youth group, unfortunately, we're going to cancel today. Uh, Courtney has been exposed to some germs, and so we just want, out of an abundance of caution, we're going to wait till she's in the clear before convening that youth group. But check your email, and she'll have more information for you. Next week, our office administrator, Gail, is on vacation. So if you need anything important, please email me during that time. And um, next week, we have quite a bit of stuff happening at the church. Firstly, we have a spirituality conference featuring Reverend Tally Harrison on thriving congregations. Sign-ups for that are out in the um, coffee space out there and also online if you look at our e-news. Um, but we do have about a 30-second video of Tally to share this morning just to give you a flavor of who he is, to kind of give you a teaser of um, what you might expect next next Saturday if you choose to join us, which we hope you do. So let's play the video first. Per se, and I love history. I'm an undergrad in history. But we are called to remember because we're constantly under renewal. We're constantly within. We're, we, are the, we are the tree that drops its seed and renews itself through that process of, um, uh, of that way of seeds falling to the ground and growing and becoming new again, right? We're, we're always seeking that because that, that's what, that's what this, the mission of God is in the world. So, so. Like we said, it was just a teaser. <laughs> but um, Tally is a very dynamic speaker, and I hope you can join us next Saturday, and your registration helps us estimate how many box lunches to purchase. Also, next weekend, after worship, we're going to have like a three-minute congregational meeting, because I'm that good at moderating congregational meetings, to nominate new elders and deacons, and their information is in the bulletin if you'd like to see the names. Um, just a, a, a request, which is if you ever have questions before a congregational meeting, it really does help us if you ask those in advance so we can research those answers. And it's also generally discouraged to make nominations from the floor. So if you, again, have thoughts or questions, just let us know in advance so we can do these meetings effectively as a team. You may notice it's a little bit cold in here today. Our heater is on the fritz, which I actually think is a good reminder of the stewardship drive because <laughs> your dollars do help um, some of the hidden costs of the mission and ministry of our church, like um, possibly needing to replace the heater in the sanctuary. So if, for those of you who have gotten your pledges in, we're really so grateful to you. Our goal is to hit a budget of 420 k next year with a mix of pledges and plate offerings. So I do know we have a few slides we want to share. I want to make sure we've done that. <laughs> Why procrastinate? Thank you for your support. There are pledge cards if you don't have one in the back by the plates and also by the front door. And all gifts are appreciated. We have a handful. Oh, I, oh, we also want to highlight there are Lego um, Sunday School uh, artwork that they've made in their last program. We encourage you to check that out during the coffee hour as well in the back. A handful of folks have indicated wanting to become members of the church, and I've been meeting with them, and we'll do a membership um, process here in the next few weeks. But if you've been wanting to become a member of the church, please reach out to me, and we'll get you in that group um, and do you all at once if we can, and we would love to welcome you into our church family. I think I only have one more. Garden meeting after worship, 1045, for garden enthusiasts as we build our community garden in the back property this summer. And with that, please rise in body or in spirit for our call to worship. 
In worship, we tell a story. In worship, we tell a story. In worship, we tell a story. So may we remember who we are. May we reimagine this world to see what God sees. It's all that easy, and it's all that hard. Let us worship holy God. Join together now for our first hymn, We Praise You, O God. join me in our prayer of confession. Holy God, to restore is to bring back. So today, we bring our hearts back to you, our thoughts back to love, and our prayers back to peace. We try to stay in this place, but we confess it's never been that easy for us. We flirt with reconciliation and then back away. We come face to face with an opportunity for justice, but get scared. We are offered an opportunity to rewrite our story, but we lose our way. Bring us back to this moment. Bring us back to your story, where brothers extend grace to one another, and even the one who denied it was forgiven. Bring us back, restore us, forgive us. Gratefully we pray, amen. Friends, hear these words of assurance. By grace you have been saved by faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, do not sit down, but instead, please share the peace of Christ with your neighbor. The peace of Christ be with you. Please wave, elbow bump, shake hands. <laughs>
Our scripture reading, the first one today, is from Genesis 33, verses 1 through 17. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And finally, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, To find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No, please, if I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly, you see, your face is like seeing the face of God, since you have received me with such favor. Please accept my gift that is brought to you, <laughs> because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have everything that I want. So he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us journey on our way, and I will go alongside you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and that the flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me. And if they are overdriven for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly, according to the pace of the cattle that are before me, and according to the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, Let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, Why should my Lord be so kind to me? So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and built himself a house, and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the place is called Succoth. And our second reading today comes from John 21, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples to the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, and they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. 
This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Holy wisdom, holy word. Please pray with me this morning. Gracious God, we cannot do the work of restoration without your word. We cannot do the work of remembering, releasing, or reimagining without your word. We need you like the earth needs rain and a sailboat needs wind. We come to you in prayer to ask that you breathe new life into us. Grant us the clarity needed to hear your word anew. And as you do, restore us to your breath. Restore us to your word. And restore us to one another. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Well, over the last few weeks, we have been thinking about stewardship and our own money stories and have looked at the spiritual practices of remembering, releasing, and reimagining. And this is an important topic. So today we're going to conclude by focusing on the spiritual practice of rest restoration. And it's a topic that I don't hear a lot of people talking about, but it's very important because stewardship can help us heal and restore store broken relationships. For example, after the extremely horrific internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, legislation was passed to pay over $1 billion in reparations to over 80,000 Japanese Americans. And to be very clear, that act of stewardship did not wipe clear all the pain and the suffering and the trauma caused by the internment of these innocent citizens into camps, but it was was a very important step in the healing and in that restoration journey as our nation began to acknowledge the harm that was done. So when you look at our first text for today, we find Jacob and Esau, two deeply estranged brothers, experiencing an unexpected moment of restoration and reconciliation with one another after years of pain and strife. And in our second text, Jesus appears after his death to his disciples and fills their empty nets with fish. This literal and symbolic act Act shows us that Jesus restores our hope and provides an abundant feast. So what is restoration really? What is this spiritual practice? The most simple definition of restoration is that restoration is a response to grace. And I'll say that again, restoration is a response to grace. Restoration is a relational act accomplished either between individuals or between us and creation or between us and God. And restoration between people sometimes looks like apologies or making amends, um, atonement, making corrections. Restoration between us and creation might look like regenerative farming practices. It looks like conservation efforts. It looks like composting even. And restoration between us and God looks like a lot of things. It can look like confession and mercy or humility and holiness, or it can even be healing and liberation. So ultimately, transformation comes to us when we give the gift of intentional change to repair our broken world. And in the giving of our gifts, we find ourselves reconciled to God. Restoration is the pinnacle act of stewardship. So let's look at that Genesis text for a moment and let me give you some background. Some of you remember from your Sunday school days that Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright. If you remember the hairy arm situation. And let's be honest, you know back in Sunday school you thought it was all just about an arm. Now you're an adult, you're like, oh, I get it. It's a little deeper than that. That birthright had a lot entailed to it. So 
not only did that harm Esau, but it, it harmed Esau's future generations, future descendants. And that act of harm was an act that perpetuated generational trauma, which we all know is not easily healed or undone. Many of you know this is from your, from your own lives, how when a family has patterns of abuse or harmful acts, that ripple, they can ripple from generation to generation unless someone decides it's time to break the cycle. Unless someone says, okay, it's time to restore, to heal, to reconcile, to move forward. So as we approach this scene, Jacob has wrestled with a stranger in a few chapters back. It was actually an angel prior to this moment. And now in preparing to meet his estranged brother, the brother that he had deeply harmed, he is wrestling internally with his feelings about his relationship with Esau, uh, probably wrestling with his thoughts about how he uh, betrayed his father in some ways, and frankly, his own sense of self-worth which deep down was the unaddressed underlying issue that stirred this all up in the first place. This story reminds me about a funeral I did years ago. I did a funeral for this lovely, wonderful elderly woman who had two adult children, a son and a daughter, and they were deeply estranged. In fact, they were so estranged that they wanted to host two separate memorial services because, it, I'm, I know, that's how I felt about it. They wanted two separate memorial services because they could not suck it up to just bear with each one another for an hour and my don't worry we only did one but it took a lot of finagling but they had this ugly rift clearly and they didn't want to tell me all the details but there were hints about it having to do with bad feelings over their splitting of their father's estate several years before so anyway, a few weeks after the funeral, the siblings were taking turns cleaning out their mother's house and they would alternate which days they went to the house because they didn't want to see each other and do their fair share of the work. And one day they got their schedules messed up so they both showed up on the same day. Um, and so they realized like they just needed to get it done. So they were gonna trudge through and clean it out at the same time together. And while they were cleaning, they discovered a note behind a pile of towels in the linen closet. And it was in their mother's handwriting, and she had wrote their two names. And then she wrote, please forgive one another. So they broke down. <laughs> and they drove to my office after finding that note. They were both convinced it was the work of the Holy Spirit, that it was God compelling them through their mother's note to restore their relationship. And it was an amazing experience to behold. These two siblings, in many ways, mirrored what we see here with Jacob and Esau. In fact, Jacob sends gifts ahead of livestock and more just to soften his brother ahead of their big reunion. And in verse 9, Esau releases his resentment and hurt and anger, and he says, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And so I want you to think for a moment about the role of restoration in your own life. And by the way, our first instinct typically is to think about the ways we've been victimized, which is okay, but the harder and more necessary step is to think about the ways our own actions may need, lead us to need to seek restoration in our relationships with others, the ways we have been broken. And stewardship calls us to examine our own stories, our own hearts, and our own relationships, especially as we confront and investigate our own fears and desires, especially in regards to money and possessions. So as you wrestle, is there a chance that you have a sense that maybe in some way the Spirit of God is nudging you to embody the work of restoration. 
in the story, Jacob eventually does bow before Esau, and he states, if you will do me the favor, accept this gift from me, since to see your face is for me like seeing the face of God, and you have received me so kindly. So ultimately, we find that Jacob repents and gives of himself back to Esau. Giving is a gift to him, and the restoration experienced is priceless. Let's take a quick moment and turn to our gospel reading today in John. When I first began this sermon series, we started with Jesus and his disciples around the table, remembering their stories and dreaming about God's economy, the new reality to come, the better way, the reign of Christ in its fullest expression. And then we find them again in this scene, Jesus and his disciples virtually in the same place, gathered and confused around a meal, which happens a lot when you eat with Jesus, apparently. And they're trying to discern the next chapter, the way forward. What they learn is that the old ways don't work. Casting their nets on the same side the way they've always done it, it's not yielding results. But uh, to cast on the other side, the old way did not work, but the new way led to abundance. So friends, I hope you will take away from this series on stewardship that the old money stories we have told ourselves don't work. They gave us a foundation, but it's time for that foundation to be restored. We have to restore our money stories and be made new through God's economy. This is our response to grace. So here's the crossroads, church. We can live the old stories, or we can make new ones by remembering and releasing and reimagining and restoring. And we also have direction from Jesus that we can let go of the ways we've always known, and we are to feed the sheep. It's that simple. So as you go out into the neighborhood this week, as you go back into your homes and to schools and workplaces or Zoom meetings, God forbid if you have another Zoom meeting, I still want you to know there are ways to apply restoration to your everyday life. We can find restoration of respect and dignity to those who are disenfranchised by oppressive economic systems. We can find restoration through our own confession and integration of our own hearts and our own relationship to money. Restoration of broken relationships between each other and in our relationship with our creator. Restoration in the form of courage which necessitates vulnerability, which none of us like, but it's needed sometimes. Restoration of our whole lives striving to embody the Imago Day as healthy, spirit-filled saints. Restoration of healthy narratives around work and play and Sabbath. And I think that's important as we read about the great resignation. What lessons are we learning in this time? And ultimately, restoration of a new economy, God's economy. So let us pray this morning. Restoring God, you restore our bodies through the gift of Sabbath. You restore our souls through the gift of grace and second chances. You restore this hurting world through the gift of mercy and your son, Jesus Christ. So help us to accept your invitation to join in this restoration work. As people of faith, we seek to restore creation to you by feeding the hungry, loving our neighbors, forgiving 70 times 7, welcoming the children, seeing all, loving all, and living like we belong to all. And so we will work until your promised day. Amen. Friends, let us continue in worship with our next hymn. 
concerns, but not to put you on the spot, Vicki, but I wondered if you wanted to highlight your special news today. Prayers of Thanksgiving for the healthy birth of our grandson, proud parents are Sarah and Casey Atkins. Casey was baptized in this church at uh, the age of eight or ten, and so um, we're drilling our church family and <laughs> Basically, she means they take church planting very seriously in their clan, and now they have baby baby Miguel, is that right? Elliot. Elliot, okay. Baby Elliot joins the family, so congratulations. Are there other joys and concerns to share? Laura. Uh, first, for our pastoral nominating committee, that they will be uplifted and encouraged and empowered to do the next steps for our church. 
continued prayers for our pastor nominating committee searching for the next installed long-term pastor of Rolling Bay Presbyterian Church and for their discernment and encouragement during this important task they've been given. Yep. I have a joy to uh, share my brother and his wife uh, flew in from Miranda, which is near Tucson, uh, and uh, by the grace of God, they're still alive with us. Although they want to wear the sun and the moon. <laughs> Prayers of the blessings of brother in town, family, and a good flight they had now in the dreary northwest with us. <laughs> uh, prayers for my husband Carl. He had a uh, so shoulder replacement on Wednesday, so he's healing up now and seems to be doing good. And the doctor's really pleased with the results. So uh, just uh, prayers for a rapid healing. Prayers of healing. <laughs> Okay, noted. Prayers of patience and prayers of healing for Carl after total shoulder replacement. A prayer for uh, the recovery of Erin Grayson after she spent several days at the uh, Harborview uh, Medical Center. Prayers for Erin as she recovers after a few days at, at the Harborview Medical Center. Um. I think you said that better than I could, but prayers of gratitude and blessings as this quilt mission project blesses those who will are, receive them shortly. Are there others this morning? Let us pray together. Restoring God, you have always been in the business of beginning again with us, of restoration and return. First you breathed life into dust, then you guided brother back to brother after years apart. You sent prophets when the people lost their way, you fed the hungry and healed the sick, you let the little children come to you. You forgave us from the cross, and then you returned to remind us of our call. You've always been in the work of restoration, of seeing us, claiming us, loving us and inviting us to return to you. So today we come to you in prayer asking that once more you would restore us, all of us. Restore our narratives about who we are to truth. Restore our actions towards one another to love. Restore our dreams for this world that you dream for us. And when our time and place tries to teach us that one's worth is their income, that one's beauty is more valuable than their soul, restore all of who we are to you. And when our time and place tries to ignore the impacts of consumer practices, may we remember the hurricanes, wildfires, and tornadoes of the last year. May we remember the consequences of global warming restore all of who we are to you. And when our church places shame, instead of caring for everyone, when we idolize tradition, instead of making room for the spirit to move, and we forget your call to love our neighbors as ourselves, restore all of who we are to you. Holy God, you have always been in the business of beginning again with us, of restoration and return. We trust that you hear our prayer, for we believe that a restored world will be a world where all are welcome at the table, where all are fed and where all belong. A restored world will be on earth as it is in heaven. And so we lift our voices together, saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For you is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, during this time of pandemic, we aren't passing the offering plates, but we do appreciate your gifts online and in the mail, and there are plates in the back if you would like to use one of those later this morning. With gratitude and praise, let us honor God with our tithes and offerings. which is all to say, this world is not what you intended it to be. You planted a garden and dreamed of Sabbath, and it was good. However, when we look around today, we know that we have lost our way. So today we bring our hearts, minds, and money back to you in hopes that you will sow good. This is the work of restoration, for we want to be a restoration people. Use these gifts for your hurting world. Restore us to you, O oh God. Amen. Let us continue with our closing hymn, Come Christians Join to Sing.
in the hallway out there. And with that, I invite you to join me in our charge and benediction. Go out to the world in peace, have courage.